like a redwood tree, upright in a forest of the Sangha. Feeling our roots spreading out into the beautiful uh, mat on the forest floor here in Ocean of Peace Meditation Hall as we listen to Three Sounds of the Bell. Yeah, dear respected Thai, dear noble community, welcome to our first uh, day of mindfulness at Deer Park since uh, many, many weeks. For it's so nice to see the hall full, <laughs> like a big forest. How many of us have seen a redwood tree or walked in the redwood forest? Can you raise your hand? Oh, many of us. The monks and nuns just came back from Northern California. We drove two days up to the coastal redwoods and uh, near Crescent City. And we camped on the banks of the Smith River. And for many of our brothers and sisters, it was the first time seeing a redwood tree. <clears throat> when I was 13, something like that, I think my only, my second trip on a plane, I came out to uh, to that area and my father was on a business trip and he wanted to introduced me to the redwoods. And I most distinctly remember after landing in Redding, driving up, and it was already dark, and eventually the road started winding. <laughs> and if any of you have been on those roads that go through the redwood forest, for someone like New England, a New Englander like me, you know, usually you put the road down and you think about the trees later. <laughs> but here the road accommodates to the trees. And so I hadn't seen that on a major road, maybe on a, a tiny road in, in the backwoods, maybe a dirt road. But this road was curving to go around the trees. <laughs> and I started to see these monstrous I, At first I didn't believe they were trees. I thought it was some kind of rock or boulder or something. I, I, and I realized these are trees, massive trees, <laughs> ancient trees, elders. Uh, 
And so the next few days I learned to walk in those trees, to look out for the banana slugs as we descended to the coast and the beautiful cliffs of Northern California. So many of us may have had the spiritual experience in nature as a child. And when we discover mindfulness, then that moment returns to us because there's this moment where we suddenly awaken to the immensity of this experience that we are, that is going on in the present moment. <laughs> um, the Buddha had an experience like that, living in the forest. Actually, as a young child, he sat under a rose apple tree, jambu. I don't know if you've eaten that fruit. It's a... In, in English, we call it rose apple, but we don't really know it that well. Like that is in, in Southeast Asia, I think in Malay, they call it jambu. Also in, in uh, Sanskrit, jambu. So uh, in, the, in, in the Buddhist time, they called India jambu vipa, which means the island of rose apples. <laughs> Uh, so the Buddha sat under a rose apple tree as a child and he watched the farmers turning up the soil of the field for the spring. And he watched also all the, the insects, the worms living in the soil, kind of like um, genocide. <laughs> this, uh, all all uh, being cut up and disturbed, the, the native habitat being literally turned over. And he felt, he got in touch with the suffering of living beings, and that was his first moment of insight into the Dhamma. He had a very deep concentration experience for me, I remember very distinctly being on uh, the back bowls of Breckenridge. Uh, it's a ski mountain in Colorado. <laughs> I grew up in a skiing family. And I was alone and still relatively young. I can't remember, maybe 15. And, uh, and it had started snowing. And there was no one else on those, those bowls. It was just the pine trees and the sound of the snow touching the surface of the snow that was already there. And we can enjoy our breathing as we mindfully listen to the sound of the cell phone ringing. We have a very special meditation in Deer Park. How many of you have uh, like a cell phone or mobile phone? No, I don't believe it. Come on. <laughs> okay, we're going to do a little meditation with our cell phone. So we can, you have to be honest. I want everybody who has a cell phone to now take it out and hold it up into the air, okay? We're going to proudly display our phone. I don't care if it's Android or iPhone or what it is. Even if, I don't care if you're a monk or a nun. Okay. You hold it up? Okay. And we're going to look at it and smile. Smile to our cell phone. Now, I don't want, I don't want you to look at your neighbor and say, like, she, does she have a Samsung? Does he have Apple? Yeah. as if that were the determinant of their personality. <laughs> and then we're going to mindfully breathe. Now, it's different for every phone, so you, you know the best way, but usually I think you hold the button a long time, and then a little thing comes up which says, power off. <laughs> so we're going to save, we're, we're, we're going to practice saving power here, okay? So everybody breathe in, breathe out, 
and hold down the power off button. <laughs> And now you can drag your finger across. <laughs> ah. We are free. <clears throat> so back to this uh, snow <laughs> bowl in Breckenridge <laughs> before the age of iPhones. Yeah, and you know, I recognize that I'm very privileged to be able to be skiing on the back bowl of Breckenridge Mountain. <laughs> mm. Anyhow, I, 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 I suddenly had this, uh, this experience of n no separation. No separation between the snow and the water in my body. No separation between the mountain and my bones. No separation between the sky and my breath. No separation between my body and the earth. And I couldn't describe it like that in words until I became a monk. <laughs> and I reflected on that experience. And we all may have had experiences like that in our lives, where we've finally woken up in a, in a kind of the purity, the, the innate uh, suchness of things. And we realize there's already enough conditions for us to be happy. In a moment like that, you don't need to live another second. Your life is already complete. What has to be done has been done. So I had a little bit of that experience seeing the immensity of the redwood trees and for the first time and walking in them. And, and so we're very fortunate, the, the monks and nuns, uh, because there's so much snow in the Sierra Nevadas, they, they moved the Sangha trip to uh, go to the redwoods. And the first day of walking in the redwoods was so joyful. <laughs> because uh, to see the, the, the massive girth of the redwoods, the fibrous bark, put our hands on it, look up and not be able to see the, the top of the tree, seeing the giant burls coming out the side, the root when it, the redwood has fallen over, two or three times our height. And the, the, the new trees and mosses and lichens growing on the fallen trunk of the redwoods, crisscrossing through the forest floor. So somehow the monks and nuns got very excited, very happy. <laughs> I remember when we were driving back from that first walk and uh, one of the sisters And my band sister, Lokneem, said, Thai, we should write a Redwood Sutra. <laughs> and so uh, we started to think of all the qualities of a Redwood that uh, are admirable. And uh, the next day after breakfast, we started to write it down. And uh, every night when we were camping, the monks and nuns would gather around the fire after dinner and sing songs. And we tried to have every monk and nun, even if you didn't think you could sing any song, you should sing a song, <laughs> at least one. And uh, the Sangha then uh, asked me to read the, the draft of the Redwood Sutra. And so uh, I read it and we translated it into Vietnamese so everyone could understand. And then uh, after listening to it, the monks and nuns were, were very happy and they put it into practice. <laughs> so today I'm gonna share some bits of this uh, new Redwood Sutra. 
But first, I'd like to uh, draw something like a redwood <laughs> on the board. Please be very compassionate at my capacity to draw. And I want to have another one coming out. You know, they sometimes they have double. So this is a little bit deceptive. Oh, yeah, let me uh, let me draw a little monk. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll draw. A, how about a nun embracing the redwood? <laughs> oh wait, one more monk taking a picture. <laughs> we took a lot of pictures. <laughs> I told you, please be compassionate. <laughs> okay. Thus have I heard one time when the venerable Mriga Vatamsaka was residing in the Del Norte redwoods by the banks of the Smith River, California. I wanted to say in the country of California, but I don't know if that was controversial. <laughs> After eating a breakfast of grilled corn, together with the Sangha, the venerable Mriga Vatamsaka spoke to the assembled monks and nuns, surrounded by firs and redwoods, with nomads, campers, squirrels, jays, elk, and a bear nearby. O oh, friends of the forest, there are eight qualities of a redwood tree that make it an exceptional tree, worthy of respect and admiration. What are the eight? The redwood knows how to grow its wood in such a way it protects itself from infection and rot. Two, the roots of the redwood know how to grow laterally on the forest floor and interlock with each other's roots into a mat to support its enormous weight. Three, the redwood can tolerate shade well for many years as a sapling until it has access to sunlight when it grows up straight rapidly to reach the top of the forest canopy. Four, the seed of the redwood is small, like a tomato seed, but it grows higher than any other tree. Five, the trunk of a fallen redwood provides a surface and sustenance for the younger generations, which put down their roots in and over it. Six, the burls and crotches of the redwood create soil, access to sunlight, and water for many other plants, huckleberries, ferns, mosses, lichens, and other trees 
and animals that grow and live on it. Seven, the redwood harvests the fog and rain, providing water for itself and the forest floor below. And eight, a redwood knows that it, that it can grow most beautifully, tall and stably in a grove, supporting and protecting uh, one another in harmony. In the same way, O oh friends of the forest, when a monastic or a practitioner in our Sangha knows how to put into practice these eight qualities of a redwood, they also become an exceptional monk or nun, worthy of respect and admiration. What are these eight qualities? One, a monastic knows how to protect themselves and protect others with their practice of the precepts and fine manners. From sense impressions that give rise to craving or hatred. Impressions arising from the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body or the mind. They see that these sense impressions are as fleeting as a bubble, a flash of lightning, or a magic trick, and their mind is not attached to or carried away by them. That is how a monastic protects themselves from infection. So, um, you know, redwood trees have a very thick bark. If you put your hand on it, it feels like a, it's almost like, not quite like cardboard, but it's like kind of spongy. You can kind of push, push into it, and it's got deep furrows. So that thick fibrous bark protects the tree from infection. And also has chemical defenses, right? So tannin, lignin, that's produced in, that have antimicrobial, antimicrobial properties. So if there is an infection, then it can neutralize it very quickly. <laughs> so in the same way, we practice with our sense impressions. Right? So the path of a monastic or a practitioner is not to not have sense impressions or try to ignore <laughs> sense impressions, but we don't get carried away by images that we see on the internet, like uh, we start binge watching Netflix or <laughs> YouTube. <laughs> when we, we feel suffering inside or we don't know what to do with our time. So we, we're able to stop, right? This, because we have our mindfulness practice. So we come back to the present moment and we know that this is not nourishing. <laughs> this is not the kind of nourishment that will lead us to grow straight and tall on our spiritual path. But we might go a little bit like this way. <laughs> And so mindfulness helps us to be aware of that. Oh, there I go again. It could be with food. You know, we go and you open the refrigerator and you look inside. What are you doing in that moment? <laughs> right? <laughs> what is going on in your mind when you open the fridge? It's kind of boredom, right? Do you, do you really feel hungry? I notice that usually when I do that, when I was a kid, I open the fridge and I just stare inside. <laughs> with the cold air coming out. It's not because I'm hungry. I'm just curious, like, is there anything like new or interesting that mom brought home <laughs> in the grocery store? It's like watching the news. I heard that now you, you can, like, there's smart fridges, and they know when you're low on a certain ingredient, and it will, like, order it on Amazon. Like, so you don't even have to look to see in the fridge before you go shopping? Is that, Jennifer is <laughs> nodding her head. She worked at Google, so I, I trust her. Does anybody do that? Can you be honest? Like, have your, your, your food items automatically replenished online? No, okay, nobody does that. I didn't think that people, do they really do that? But you say, okay, some people did. <laughs> there you go, okay. Um, but anyway, that, that experience, right? And then you just, you're just 
being assailed by sense impressions. Or the other thing is going to a grocery store when you're hungry. Very dangerous. <laughs> right? The rule is you have to be like fully, really full before you go to the grocery store. And some people, like, they, of course, you have a list, right? The shopping list. And some people are very you know, disciplined. And that's a way of training ourselves not to get carried away by sense impressions. What's on sale? Right? What items are, are next to it? Like the romantic music from the 80s that's playing. As you walk down, it's like, yeah, I feel young again. The bangles are playing. Yeah, I remember that. You know, it's like, <laughs> I feel good. I'm going to buy that item. Like, you know. So these are all the kind of things that the, you know, we can learn from the redwood tree. Like the, the mindfulness is kind of chemical defense, right? It, it's not there to kill, but it's there to help us to, like an immune system. So mindfulness can strengthen our immune system so that we're not carried away by sense impressions. Right? We see that they are just like, a, like a, an illusion. They're literally produced by our nervous system in order to help us to recognize when fruit is ripe, what's good, good to eat, what might be poisonous in nature, but that now has been co-opted by our you know, modern society that we have not evolved to live in, really, <laughs> in harmony. And so advertising and bright colors, like, you can never tell now by the color of a tomato if it's going to taste good. It's just like a bubble of water, right? So we have these bright vegetables. We've even you know, cultivated vegetables to be certain colors that are pleasing to the eye, but not pleasing to the mouth of the body. <laughs> so we are changing our environment actively based on our sense desires. Yeah, to kind of, so that's why you see it's an illusion that what looks like a very sweet tomato is actually pretty bland. <laughs> The redwood has resistant heartwood. So not only the bark, but the heartwood in the core of the tree. It contains high levels of extractives, natural compounds that provide protection. It also can compartmentalize infection. So one thing that allows the redwood to live so long is that when it, some infection happens, it can isolate it. It doesn't let it take over the entire tree. Here we have a problem with beetles in the oak trees. Kind of beetle that has been, it will get in and it will take over the entire tree. And we, sometimes we don't even know for many years that that tree is very ill and dying until we have a storm and it falls over. So the same is true of a practitioner. Sometimes we think, I'm a very good mindfulness practitioner. I come to Deer Park regularly. I... Uh, you know, I read all, I have Mindful Magazine coming to my, you know, my postal address. I get, uh, what else, what else is in the spiritual materialistic culture of mindfulness? We might even be a mindfulness professor at a prestigious university <laughs> now, all right? Or you could be the mindfulness director at your business. These are all things in the mindfulness industry. But if, it, if inside we are not taking care of how we relate to sense impressions that come in, then that is all just the outer form. And inside, in the heartwood, there is an infection. It is taken over. So if we really practice mindfulness well, we learn to compartmentalize the infection. We don't let it take over. We say, okay. So I, one thing I like to do is focus on a part of my body which is not experiencing pain. When I have a painful feeling or I feel pulled away by a strong emotion. For example, I can come back to my bones. They're very solid. <laughs> They're not affected by this uh, romantic feeling in my gut <laughs> or whatever it is. All these uh, hormones that are being kind of stimulated in that moment. Or maybe it's just indigestion. And you, you start to like psychoanalyze yourself because of, you have a little bit of indigestion. Oh, it's because of the way my mom treated me when I was 
you know, four years old. It doesn't mean that she didn't treat you well, but it means you're, you're not comp learning to isolate the infection. <laughs> you, you, so mindfulness helps you not to completely cut off, but you, you can focus on it and say, okay, I'm not going to let that thought take over my mind. I'm not going to let these sense impressions take over my mind. The Buddha had the experience of seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, and he enjoyed his food. But those sense pleasures didn't invade and take over his mind. He said that many times. So if we are um, a little bit naive or beginning in the practice, we do a kind of like spiritual bypassing. And we say, that did not affect me. I am equanimous. And then real, but there's real suffering inside. So we put on the, the, the kind of outside form of not suffering. But inside us, we are deeply, deeply wounded. So, that, so it's not that sense impressions don't come in through our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, but we don't let them invade and take over our mind. We learn to bring mindfulness to that thought and see that, that we, we are exaggerating that emotion through our way of thinking, the autocritic, the self-critic inside of ourselves. And rapid healing. So when the redwood tree um, has some kind of infection, it knows how to heal the wounds relatively quickly. So it seals off that, that wound. Some trees, when they get an opening, a wound, like if you cut the branch and you don't protect it artificially, then infection can go in through that area. But the redwood is very good at self-healing so that further infection cannot arise. So that is the first way that we can practice inspired by a redwood tree. The second. <laughs> a monastic puts down good roots like a mat throughout the Sangha, knowing how to connect with others and find joy in the whole Sangha without discrimination. They always see the good qualities in everyone and are able to help others to do the same. That is how a monastic knows how to use their roots to connect into a mat, interlocking their roots with the roots of others throughout the Sangha. So it's very interesting, a redwood tree doesn't have a taproot. So many trees, like the oaks we have here, put down a deep root at the base, which goes down to get uh, water that, and nutrients deep in the soil. But a redwood tree doesn't have that strategy. A redwood puts its roots out laterally, way beyond the, the diameter of its uh, crown. And that, those roots interlock with other red, the roots of other redwood trees that are nearby. So when the wind comes or there's a storm, those roots are very stable. It's about three to, three to five feet thick, the layer of roots, interlocking roots that the redwood trees create. So they actually benefit each other by growing together. So if uh, one is threatened, they are all threatened. But together, they create a lot of stability. So even without a taproot, they're able to grow bigger than any other tree. So there's a sense of uh, taking refuge in the community. So this is a kind of antidote to a, a strongly individualistic culture in America. Tai often said the century, the 20th century is a century of individualism. And we need to learn to to go beyond 
that narrow point of view, that narrow approach. America seemed to be, in the minds of its founders, this kind of vast, empty canvas. And we know how painful that way of thinking has resulted in how much pain and suffering that, that attitude has. And so uh, European settlers expanded across the country and treating it like a blank canvas, <laughs> pushing out the indigenous peoples, uh, breaking treaties, making and breaking treaties. <laughs> and that kind of attitude has, led, uh, has supported this culture of the kind of rugged individual. <laughs> But now we live on an interconnected planet. There's nowhere else to expand to. <laughs> we cannot li continue to live under the pretense that the individual is supreme. And so Thai, uh, or that even look back on history and think that there was some benefit to that kind of thinking. When we look deeply, actually, the foundation of what we have is uh, the work of many, many communities. Unions, workers, everyday people. <laughs> Collaborating, working together, crossing boundaries of race, class. That is the heart of this, uh, of this uh, experiment <laughs> we call America. <laughs> and that's true not only here on this continent, but also around the world. We cannot pretend that we, uh, for the sake of our individual uh, success, <laughs> that we uh, can do things which are immoral or wrong according to the community. And so Thay trained us as monastics to learn to let go of our idea. I think the, it's one of the most important practices I learned as a, as a monk in, in the Plum Village Sangha because I had a lot of ideas, and I still have a lot of ideas. <laughs> one of my sisters said, you know, Brother Fablu, he, she was talking about me and one other sister, she said, you know, the Sangha really uh, would be happy if Brother Fablu would uh, have less ideas, or <laughs> you tire, tire the Sangha out. <laughs> too, too many projects. Something like that. I was like, hmm, maybe... Maybe reflect a little bit <laughs> on my practice of letting go. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I know I have to let go of my idea when the Sangha is not ready for it or the Sangha uh, sees that it's not beneficial. And that's a point for me to reflect on my own practice, to take refuge in the community. I cannot pretend to think I know better than the community, but I need to rather learn to listen like a musician a good musician knows how to open their ears, is a good listener, and hears the music that is being played, whether it's a note being played or whether it's the silence between the notes. Because oftentimes the silence is more important than the note. And if we're just playing a lot of notes, we're not, we, we don't have the opportunity to open our ears and listen and look deeply. So that's in my own uh, practice. I try to, <laughs> you know, and more. Yeah, so opening my ears and listening deeply more and letting go of my idea. Brotherhood and sisterhood, siblinghood is more important than any idea. Even the Dhamma. I said, if a, uh, if you have to choose be between uh, the Buddhism and brotherhood and sisterhood, brotherhood and sisterhood is more important. Right? We should not try to take our idea, even our idea about what the Buddha taught, the Dhamma, and override the, the harmony of the community. And so that's a, that's a uh, can be challenging for those of us who are raised still with this rugged individualist <laughs> kind of ideology, to learn to put our, our roots laterally, to take refuge in the community, even when we think we have a better idea. 
the redwood might think, oh, I, I, I will you know, want to be the highest redwood. <laughs> but in doing so, it, can, it, it cannot ever reach the top of the forest canopy. It needs to take refuge. So it puts out its roots in every direction without discrimination. Maybe we can listen to a sound of the bell. Sit beautifully like a redwood. Enjoy respiring. A monastic knows well their great aspiration to wake up and help all beings to be free. And they also know how to be patient in the practice. Thanks to the strength of their aspiration, they walk straight on the path of liberation, whether they encounter many difficulties or few obstacles, growing strong and straight in the Sangha. That is how a monastic can tolerate shade well for many years until they have access to sunlight when they grow up straight rapidly to reach the forest canopy. So it's very interesting. A redwood uh, seedling and sapling, when it first comes up, it's very small. And it has no chance to get the full sunlight of the trees around it. But it turns out that redwood trees can tolerate shade for many, many decades and still grow very slowly, establishing itself with its roots, with its branches. And uh, in other forests, other kinds of trees, they might uh, you know, give up <laughs> very soon. And only one tree, only when a big tree falls, will the one tree that happens to be in the right spot then shoot up. <laughs> but a redwood tree can tolerate shade. So if you, I was very curious, like how there's so many massive trees in this forest and they're so close to each other. <laughs> it's due to the, and then I learned, it's due to this quality of tolerating shade. So when we start out as a mindfulness practitioner, sometimes we want to become you want to go straight to enlightenment, become a Dhamma teacher, start putting our talks on YouTube, you know, teaching everyone, doing consultations for hours with people, teaching them the Eightfold Noble Path and the Four Noble Truths, and we become a kind of Buddhist evangelist. <laughs> and then suddenly we have a difficulty, and we suffer. And we have trouble putting into practice what we've been telling others. <laughs> and then we fall away from the, the path and the community. And we think it's like we're looking in the refrigerator again. Now we, like we tried the apple diet, now we're going to switch to a potato diet, or I don't know what. <laughs> because we gave up. We said, my suffering was not solved by the apple diet, now I need to take, do a potato diet. <laughs> And we go to another community or another uh, spiritual tradition. But then the same thing happens there. And after a few years, we suffer again. And because we do not come back to ourselves and recognize that our suffering is coming from within, primarily due to our ancestral uh, lineage, our family, our society, all these conditions which have conspired to... to give rise to this body and mind complex <laughs> that we experience in the present moment. And we blame the outside conditions instead. And we think, if I just put myself somewhere else, then I will find the right, true spiritual path. So if we're a good practitioner, though, we take another way. We say, we know how to tolerate the shade. Say, I'm only getting a little bit of filtered sunlight, 
but I can grow slowly and establish my roots in the Sangha and know that there are still many obstacles that may come my way. We don't wish for a spiritual path without obstacles. We know that the obstacles are the path. So Tai wrote a beautiful book, No Mud, No Lotus. Without the mud, how can we grow lotuses? <laughs> Without the suffering and difficulty of our own afflictions, our own obstacles of the mind and the body, how can we expect to grow? In fact, we can look in the Mahayana way that afflictions themselves are enlightenment. And we bring mindfulness to that block of suffering inside ourselves and just shine the light of mindfulness on it. We don't expect happiness to come right away or joy. We just, we have a patience. We get a little bit of joy, a little bit of happiness. Instead of just continuing with the automatic thinking, we shine the light of mindfulness on that suffering. And then if we do it consistently, over time it starts to transform. We see that it's not what we thought it was. In our automatic thinking, kind of zombie thinking, we think we know that suffering. I know some, some people, they get very attached to their suffering. They love to talk about it with other people all the time. <laughs> it becomes like a, their personality. Right? My suffering. They don't know what to talk about with other people, so they talk about their suffering. So it doesn't mean we can't talk about our suffering with others, but we have to be careful. We might get attached to that suffering. And we get a little bit frightened if that suffering goes away. <laughs> if we actually have happiness, peace, and joy. So we can practice like the redwood. We can tolerate shade and grow beautifully, quietly, gently. And then when suddenly the sunlight when one of the elders falls down, perhaps, there's an opening in the canopy. Then we have this kind of a dhamma which has been nourished in our own way of living for many years and we can shoot up very quickly <laughs> towards the sunlight and become one of the great, the, the, the noble sangha of elders to transmit the dhamma. So we let the sangha, the dhamma, Lift us up. We don't lift ourselves up. As one of my elders once told me, if you find yourself grasping towards something to get recognition, then that's not a stable. You cannot be a stable member of the redwood forest. So our practice is in also letting go of our idea, but we also let the Sangha raise me up. I don't give this Dhamma talk because I personally want to. The Sangha asked me to do it. Right? So it's, there's a sense of the Sangha holding us, and the Sangha has a deeper insight than any individual. Number four, a monastic knows that learning the Dhamma and progressively putting it into practice gives them a predisposition for rapid vertical growth. And and so they do not become dispirited by the time it takes to transform their afflictions. Though they may come to the Sangha with just the tiny seed of a spiritual life, a monastic or practitioner who takes refuge in the Dhamma and spreads out roots in all directions in the Sangha soon establishes a stable practice and uses this imperturbable stability to grow ever higher, ever stronger. That is how a monastic practices to grow higher than any other tree, even though it starts out small as a tomato seed. So I think I already commented a bit on that one. <laughs> Number five, a monastic knows how to live in the Sangha and practice the Dhamma in such a way that their actions continue to nourish their younger brothers and sisters for many generations into the future. The actions of body, speech, and mind of that monastic become nourishment for future generations, even long after the dissolution of their physical body. In this way, their younger, sibling, younger siblings establish stability in their practice, 
That is how a monastic provides sustenance for future generations, which put down their roots around them. So we are fascinated by how the forest floor is littered with fallen redwood trees. So maybe this tree uh, falls over. And you have these big roots coming up. And we saw that there are trees growing on top of the fallen redwood tree, <laughs> putting its roots down around on both sides of the tree, as well as mosses and all kinds of other plants and animals living on the fallen tree. So all the nutrients caught up in the tree become available for the next generation. Especially you know, when that tree has grown up big and strong. So Tai, our teacher, is a great example. Tai is a big redwood tree, <laughs> the highest in the forest of the Sangha. And Tai always trained us not to see Tai as a guru, as an individual. We have a teacher, we are Thai students, we have a, a relationship, just like the sapling knows that, you know, what its situation is in relationship to the big, <laughs> the big redwood. And, but when Thai had a stroke, <laughs> and then our teacher passed away last year, we know that thanks to the Dhamma body, which Thai has transmitted, uh, even the Thai's uh, physical body has transformed <laughs> into a cloud and the rain and the earth. That thanks to Thai's Dhamma body, it we can continue to grow and nourish ourselves. We have uh, Thai's talks online. <laughs> we have Thai's books. But I would say even deeper, we have the transmission of Thai's Dhamma body through the Sangha through the living Sangha. It's nice to listen to a talk on the YouTube channel. It's nice to read Thai's books. It can help us remember, but for me, where I see Thai most strongly is in the Sangha. Just like the redwood trees, most beautiful continuation is in the redwood forest around it. The living redwood forest that many people can walk on and benefit from. That is Thai's continuation body. And so these trees that nourish themselves with the fallen redwood, they are, that is a, all of us Thai's continuation body. <laughs> and as the trunk starts to decay over many years, all those nutrients go back to the soil and nourish future generations of redwoods as they grow up big and tall in the forest. And so now at Deer Park, we have, a, we have like a, a the new redwoods <laughs> teaching the Dhamma. In Plum Village, we have the new forest of redwoods. They're growing up on Thai's Dhamma body. So there are many groves. You might want to wander into the Plum Village grove. If you're nearby Deer Park, you wander into the Deer Park grove of redwoods. <laughs> if you're near uh, Magnolia Grove Monastery, you can wander into the Magnolia Grove. <laughs> and that is uh, Thai's continuation body nourishing itself from this big redwood. <laughs> Number six, a monastic knows how to build a sangha wherever they go, making good use of the conditions that manifest wherever they find themselves. They know how to transform suffering in such a way that becomes, it becomes a, a platform for others to grow closer to the sunlight. They know that happiness is not an individual matter and that the transformation of their own suffering can help many living beings suffer less. That is how a practitioner practices to allow the burls and crevices to create soil and access to sunlight and water so that many other plants and animals can grow on it.
I took many notes about redwood trees <laughs> for this talk. So we notice that uh, the trees have these uh, kind of big growths. Sometimes they're down by the, by the root system. And out of those growths, we had new trees coming up straight out of the, the burl. It's called a burl. It's like a, a tiny uh, branch. <clears throat> and the redwood has a quality, as it grows up, it drops its lower branches. And uh, so that the, it can put all its energy into growing straight up as high as possible. And then when it reaches the sunlight, it puts out new branches. So it's like a kind of other forest that only a few people have been able to experience. You have to be a kind of arborist or tree climber <laughs> to get up into the, the crown of the redwood tree. Um, so those, uh, those bits can turn into, grow, grow over into a burl, and then new trees can come up out of there. As well, um, we saw many trees that were growing, sometimes two, three, four trunks splitting off as it went up high into the sky. So in those crevices between the trees, mosses and lichen grow and die and create soil. And so you actually have all kinds, a whole kind of microclimate happening just within the, the body of the redwood tree. <laughs> In the, in the crotch or in the burrow of the tree. Kind of microhabitat. It retains the water. So uh, in the, the next uh, one, I talk about harvesting the fog. It's very interesting. The, the redwood is so high that when the marine layer comes in, this is why we have these giant redwood trees, the marine layer that comes in from off of the Pacific is captured by the grove of redwood trees. And the structure of the leaves of the redwood, the kind of needle-like leaves, actually precipitates the fog and causes it to turn into water droplets, which then spill off and go down the trunk, fall down, to the forest floor as well as into these crevices and where the moisture is retained to nourish all kinds of insects, plants, birds, invertebrates. Kind of niche space within the tree. So we can, as a practitioner, make good use of all situations. And when we are practicing very well, others can use our practice. They can borrow our energy of mindfulness to support their own practice. So when we come together at a place like Deer Park and practice together, it's like that. We borrow the collective energy. We're like a, a, temp, you know, a Sunday redwood forest. <laughs> and each mindful step during mindful walking of the community around us is contributing to our own capacity to grow in our practice. Each mind, uh, the mindful, the silence of mindful eating we'll experience later is supporting us in our own practice of mindfulness. So in that way, the, the big solid redwoods that we have around us, the monks and nuns and the long-term lay practitioners, they are like supporting us and we can if we are just new, we might be a little tree or <laughs> moss growing on the burl or in the crotch of the tree. Number seven. A monastic sees that everything can be a Dhamma teaching and nourishment for the happiness and insight. The more established they become in the Dhamma, the more others can take refuge in them and benefit from their presence. That is how a monastic harvests the fog, providing water for itself and the forest floor below. So 
Just like the tree, the redwood, makes good use of the fog, we can learn how to make good use of every situation, whether it's a sunny day, a foggy day, a storm. We can, you know, when, when there's a storm, the redwood puts its refuge in the roots, the stability, the interlocking stability it has with the other redwoods. When there's a light fog in the morning, the shape of the leaves allows it to harvest that fog, turn it into water droplets, which nourish itself as well as all of the other plants, the ferns and growing on the forest floor. Or if there's a rainstorm as well, the, the grove of the redwoods keeps the rain from eroding. You know, when you have bare land, then you just have serious erosion. But if you go there, the, the forest floor is like feet, many feet of duff of dead materials thanks to the fallen branches of the redwood tree and the decaying matter from all the living beings in the forest. So the redwood is actually from above instead of allowing the rain to come straight down onto the earth and wash away all that material. It kind of allows it to come down very gently. So that is how our practice of the Dhamma can help us to transform any adverse situation into a, something that helps us grow, something that nourishes us in the spirit of no mud, no lotus. So don't, don't pick and choose your experiences. <laughs> Say, I want to do that, I don't want to do that. Just let whatever happens come your way and learn how you can transform it into the Dhamma, that everything becomes a Dhamma teaching, like it's said in the Lotus Sutra. Tai, tai wrote a beautiful poem about the Lotus Sutra, uh, and I, I wish I could quote it. Maybe one of my brothers and sisters, <laughs> now would be the time I would invite one brother or sister who memorized that poem to sing it. <laughs> There's a beautiful poem about the Lotus Sutra, if you look it up, where all, all things are singing the Dhamma our reflection of the Dhamma body, singing the Lotus Sutra. Number eight. A monastic sees that it is rare, so rare, to have a chance to live in the Sangha. On the whole planet, there's only, you know, the, from a little bit over the border in Oregon down to Big Sur, <laughs> where these giant redwoods grow these giant coastal redwoods. It's quite rare. People come from all over the world to see the redwoods, this exceptional tree. A monastic sees that it is rare to find a sangha, to have a chance to live in the sangha, and doesn't waste this precious opportunity to be nourished and supported by the sangha. Seeing that their own progress is inextricably intertwined with the progress of their siblings, and that they already have more than enough conditions to be happy. They grow up strong and stable and never leave their sangha. You can imagine the redwood just saying, I'm done with this forest. This is not supporting my practice. I'm going to go walk out and so that, hang out with those Douglas firs over there. I don't know. Maybe like a... Jacarandas. Or <laughs> I don't know. They get on the internet and they search around. They say, like, I'm suffering in my community. I want to go find another one. Where there's uh, the pure land where there's no suffering. <laughs> so we put down roots where we are. So this, in the same way, whether we come from a Christian tradition, a Jewish tradition, a Muslim tradition, I, I didn't ever want to convert people to become Buddhists. He said many times, we have enough trouble getting the Buddhists to practice. <laughs> Why do we want to make more of it? <laughs> right? So he, you know, he worked with, uh, many, with Thomas Merton, Martin Luther King Jr., and many others, Daniel Berrigan, and they learned how to put down deeper roots in their own tradition right in their communities. It would be devastating for any one of them to say, okay, I met this great 
Zen master from Vietnam, I'm going to become a Buddhist now. <laughs> because there are already very solid Douglas firs or you know, whatever in their community. But they learn how to benefit from Buddhist teachings to grow out their roots, to establish themselves more deeply in their own community. So in that way, we don't try, look to try to uh, uh, uproot ourselves, <laughs> but learn how to nourish those roots as well that have been transmitted to us. Right? So we can come and practice mindfulness. It doesn't, I'm not saying if you want, you want to become a Buddhist, that's okay. <laughs> but the purpose of Deer Park Monastery and Plum Village practice is not to create more Buddhists. <laughs> right? It's to help all of us to look into our own ancestral tradition. For me, it's the Catholic tradition, the Christian tradition. And so I, I'm a Buddhist monk. <laughs> You know, I live in the community, but I learn how to understand my, my, the spiritual path of my ancestors and how I can learn not just to reject, but learn how to nourish myself, sustain myself from that, and that there's no separation there. Okay. So that is uh, how we are inextricably intertwined. And we have, right where we are, if we look deeply, we have more than enough conditions to be happy. This is how a monastic practitioner grows beautiful, tall, and stable amongst the other redwoods, supporting and protecting one another in harmony. This is how, O oh friends of the forest, a monastic practitioner, by practicing these eight qualities of a redwood, they become a, a, a monk or a nun who is exceptional, worthy of respect and admiration. Thus taught the venerable Mrigavatamsaka. <laughs> the monks and nuns alongside the nomads and campers with the bear, squirrels, and elk nearby rejoice and straight away put her teachings into practice. Okay, so this is a little bit of fun from the monastic outing, but it's, a, it's very nourishing to do this. <laughs> you know, there are many kinds of sutras, not only Buddhist sutras, there are many, uh, in many Indian traditions. Sutra is a kind of te teaching. So it's a creative way to, to share the teaching. And so this is a, based on a real situation. <laughs> a kind of way of remembering our, our insight and our brotherhood and sisterhood on our, our outing in the redwoods. But you can go back uh, to your home. Maybe you have a magnolia tree. Maybe you have... Um, uh, here in the chaparral, it's been the moment of the blossoming of the chemise. Um, and you can look deeply into a plant or an animal and see that's right by your house and see what you can learn from it in your Dhamma practice. That's a way of being like the redwood, harvesting the fog. What is coming your way? How can you transform it into a Dhamma teaching that can nourish you and nourish your community? So thank you for... Uh, receiving and putting into practice this uh, Redwood Sutra. <laughs> I hope it brought you some joy. We'll finish with the three sounds of the bell. <laughs> 